Good morning. Good morning. Come on. Now, there's not too many of you out there. But we need everybody to get together here. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all here. It's a sunny day. It's not real warm, but it's it's getting there. And it is March, so we know how that goes. Um, welcome to New Brunswick Church of Christ. We're glad you're here. Any uh, visitors, anybody we want to recognize or anything? Okay. Don't give her too hard a time, Eric. Jennifer's here. Good to have you, Jennifer. Hanging out with Eric, that's tough, but we appreciate that. <laughs> Anyone else? We are glad you're all here this morning. Just a few things to kind of highlight, and then we'll keep moving along. Um, most everything is in the bulletin, or you've probably seen it up front already. Um, uh, youth group tonight is always at 5.30, so be aware of that. Um, the leadership meeting is coming up not today, but next Sunday on the 17th for all the elders and uh, deacons and trustees and so forth. Um, a lot of things coming up, and one of the inserts kind of says that the opposite side of the prayer list, uh, upcoming fellowship events. Um, Friday the 29th will be the Good Friday Floating Communion. Um, of course, on Sunday, the 31st, would be uh, Easter and the Sunrise Breakfast. And in that regard, there's a sign-up back there in the back for uh, some of the different things they need for the Sunrise service, uh, you know, juice and milk and those kind of things. So if you could check that out sometime and you have a chance, we'd appreciate that. And then, of course, uh, a couple other things we need to be aware of, too. Uh, Sunday, April the 7th, the following Sunday after Easter, there's some new Sunday school classes beginning, so be sure and take note of that and maybe get involved there where you can. And then Monday, April 8th, the eclipse. And, you know, well, that's kind of a big deal to a lot of people. I guess it's interesting, but there's going to be some more information coming along with that. The, um, it's called totality, I guess, or something like that. So um, things that are coming, so be aware of those. Um, I don't think I have anything else to mention. As always, be sure and be aware of the things going on and kind of hold on to your bulletin and pay attention to that. Um, any other things that I might have overlooked we want to mention, Sam? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're kind of shifting to prayer time now, and Sam mentioned Nikki, Nikki is home now, and she's doing well. Um, any other Updates or news or whatever. Danny. Oh. Danny mentioned that Deanna, Deanna got diagnosed with breast cancer this week. So obviously we want to be praying for them and for her and what else. And I'd heard this week some, uh, one of the people I knew, a farmer a few years ago, actually was killed in the past week. Uh, his name is Kent Bruins, which would be, like Tyson's cousin, um, in a farm accident or whatever down around, in, well, Danville, they're from Danville. So um, we all know those tragic things happen, and uh, farmers especially know that out there working with equipment and machinery and so forth. And it is that season. Spring is pretty much here, and there'll be a lot of that going on here before long. So we need to remember that family in our prayers, and as always, the the safety of everyone that's out there on the road, in the field, and wherever. So, um, anything else? Let's uh, go to our Father in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of it. But we lift up now some, some difficult things too, Lord. There are some heavy hearts with, uh, with loss and with a cancer diagnosis and, and people recovering from surgery and things they're going through and dealing with right now and loss of loved ones and just so many different things, Lord. But we know that we can share our burdens with you, that you'll carry them for us. And we just pray for those people in their situation. And we also lift up uh, our church family here as well, many on that prayer list that we know of and uh, others that we are not aware of, Lord, but you are. Thank you for your love and your grace and just help all of us to be more aware and more loving and gracious to those around us we pray for our service this morning as we sing praises to you and 
commune with you and Dwight shares the word. Help us to have open hearts and open minds to take in what you have for each one of us that we could better live for you this week. All these things we pray in your name. Amen. Good morning. We're so glad to see you this morning, and we would love for you to stand and worship with us and put a smile on your face because it's so much nicer to look out there and see you smiling and happy. He's coming on the clouds, kings and kingdoms will bow down. Every chain will break as broken hearts declare his praise. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh, 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 oh. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before him our god is the lamb the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world his blood breaks the chains and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb oh every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. oh, oh, oh. Whoa, 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 whoa. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain. For the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chains. And every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the lion and the oh, 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 And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, 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 And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb.
And it's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. For my King, Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you. seated. singing beneath the cross of Jesus. Smitten heart with tears 
my unworthiness. How easily we sometimes judge others for their mistakes and failures. Yet how quickly we become bitter when someone sins against us. When these things occur, the church can quickly transform into a place of judgment and hurt instead of peace, one of peace and unity. God notices our sin too. He sees how we hurt others. He sees how we hide and lie to cover our shame and guilt. He sees how quickly we judge. He sees the bitterness that takes root in our hearts when we're hurt. In fact, we read in Hebrews 4.13, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. But when God sees our sin, he does not respond with judgment or bitterness as we tend to do. Instead, he looks to Jesus' work on the cross. Every sin, the hidden and the hurtful, the big and the small, was taken care of by God's own son, Jesus. As we read in John 1.29, Jesus is the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. We, when we are confronted with our own sins or the sins of others, we can look to the cross, too. Instead of defining ourselves and others by our mistakes and failures, we can define each other by Jesus' perfect work. When sin leaves us hurt and disillusioned, we can turn our eyes upon Jesus, who brought redemption and peace through his death. We can forgive not based on feeling or willpower, but based on the wonderful truth of Calvary. Today we take communion, remembering that he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our inequities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. As we eat and drink of this communion cup and wafer. Let us not focus on ourselves or others. Instead, let us fix, fix our eyes on Jesus. When we remember Jesus' ultimate sacrifice, we can know that we're unified by what he's done for each of us, not by what we've done. While sin threatens to tear us apart sometimes, Jesus' death on Calvary continues to knit us back together. What an honor it is to find ourselves side by side at the foot of the cross. What a privilege to be unified by Jesus' completed and perfect work. Let us pray. Father, we are thankful that we can serve a risen Savior, a Savior that has saved us a Savior that was willing to go to the cross for each of us, a Savior who cares and loves for us, each of us deeply. And Father, although we may sin and we fall short, we, are no, we know that through Christ Jesus our sins are forgiven. And as we partake of these emblems here today, let us remember what he did for each of us in going to that cross. It is in your Son's blessed name that we pray. Amen.
Well, hopefully you have your Bibles with you. Uh, I'd like for you to find Matthew chapter 27. Uh, We started in the uh, upper room and then we made our way to the garden and then to the, uh, the temple where Jesus went face to face with Caiaphas. And this morning we're going to work our way through a mockery of a trial that uh, Jesus was put through uh, with Pilate. And uh, it's entitled A Place of Injustice. Uh, A couple of weeks ago, when I uh, finally made it home, the uh, national news was on. And I had sat down, Joe was watching the news, and so I sat down next uh, to her, and we were talking a little bit, and then all of a sudden, a uh, special report came on. This is where there's an investigative reporter who is checking out some things and then makes a special report. And so the anchor had said, uh, prep, uh, uh, prepared us by saying, this is one of the most uh, unjust things, uh, pieces of injustice that you're going to hear in quite some time. And so it caught my attention because I knew this was coming up. And uh, the story was about uh, a a judge in Illinois who had uh, reversed his own verdict just 150 days later. He had found a young man guilty of rape and sentenced him to several years in prison. But less than three months later, he uh, changed his mind, or just over three months later, changed his mind and decided to reverse his own verdict and set him free. He said that uh, the reasoning on the assault uh, decision was that someone uh, should, as a cost of children, uh, referring to this 18-year-old as a child, uh, should have been uh, he should have been supervised better uh, and something like this violation of someone else's personhood would have been avoided and so this piece of injustice was that he thought that uh, the initial verdict uh, was wrong even though there was plenty of testimony and plenty of evidence uh, against him Uh, and he had been found guilty uh, by uh, the law uh, that uh, even though he had sentenced him to several years in prison, he decided to change that. And then since then, that that judge has been relieved of his duties. And they went on afterwards to talk about the injustice that had been done to this young woman who had been raped. And then they went on to talk about many other cases of injustice over the years and things like this had happened. Now, as terrible as all that is, and I I think it is, the most unjust uh, sentence in history, most unjust sentence in history was given by Pilate when 2,000 years ago he sentenced Jesus to death. Now, to set the stage as a reminder for all of us, Jesus was accused by the Jewish religious leaders of that day of blasphemy. Blasphemy against Jehovah, blasphemy against the temple. But he's also uh, charged with insurrection against the Roman government. And those, all the charges were false. All the witnesses that were brought against him uh, were liars. And the accusers, however, were determined to get that guilty verdict and to gain the maximum sentence. And in that day and time, the maximum sentence was crucifixion. And so Pilate, who was the governor of Judea, had the responsibility to administer justice and do so fairly. But he failed miserably. He was intimidated by the mob. He put his own self-interest ahead of serving justice in a similar way of the judge that I just referred to. 
And he was in a very difficult spot. He wanted to do what he knew was right, but he also wanted to do what he thought was politically correct to get people off his back. And so he was, even though he knew that Jesus was completely innocent, he was willing to sentence him to die the most inhumane death known to man at that time. Now let's follow the details of this mockery of a trial. It begins here in Matthew 27, verse 11. And during this time, just kind of try to put ourselves in Pilate's place because so many times we're dealing with making decisions that some people are going to find as reasonable and others are going to find as politically incorrect and we have to deal with the consequences. We make a lot of selfish choices every single day. Ours are not nearly as dramatic as what Pilate did, but they are difficult nonetheless. So the first thing is his dilemma. He was faced with a dilemma at pre-Passover morning. And to appreciate his predicament, you need to understand a little bit uh, of history from the Jewish standpoint. Pilate was an anti-Semitic Spani Spaniard. He had been appointed governor of Judea around 26 AD. He lasted, his reign lasted about 10 years. And Palestine at this point in time of history is a powder keg. It's filled with problems. Uh, the Israelites were stubborn. They were resistant to the Roman rule. They were constantly uh, having revolutions. There uh, was guerrilla warfare between uh, the Jews and the Romans. Uh, it was very similar to what we've read about and seen on TV over the last few decades taking place in the Middle East. And, and Pilate, just to be completely blunt about it, was not a great ruler. He was wishy-washy in so many different ways. That position demanded somebody who was a good diplomat, but he was a tyrant. It demanded somebody who had uh, a tactful nature, but he did not. He was stubborn. He was, he was ruthless. He was hated by the Jews. Uh, he, was, he, did not have, uh, he was not in good favor with Caesar because of all the complaints uh, against him. He was unable to keep the uh, peace in, in Palestine, and so Pilate, uh, uh, Caesar was constantly having to reprimand him for the things that he wasn't doing well. Uh, like when he initially took office, he marched his army through the city of Jerusalem, and they were carrying the Roman banners, and on the top of each pole was a little bust of, of Caesar. Now, the previous administration had, uh, when they came into town to take over, they had removed the, the bust of Caesar out of respect to the Jewish people. But he was such a tyrant and, and so obstinate, he decided that he was going to do it whether they liked it or not. And the Jewish people rebelled against it because that was a mark against one of the Ten Commandments. The, the second commandment says that, that you shouldn't have any graven image. And that was the image that was being portrayed as they were marching through the streets. And the Jews objected to that. And the previous government had thought a little bit more about it, but he didn't care. And so there was rioting and, and, and there were uh, revolutions throughout the city for a period of almost a whole week. And finally, he agreed to uh, meet with them in the amphitheater. But what he was going to do, instead of just sitting down and talking with them, is that he was going to surround the Jews with soldiers in order to get them to disperse and get back to doing what they were supposed to be doing. And if they didn't do it, he was going to threaten to kill them. Well, when that uh, came about, it fell apart for him because the Jews were already so angry, they dared him to go ahead and kill them. As a matter of fact, historians say that some of them bared their necks and said, go ahead, start with me. And so finally, he gave in to what their requests were to remove the busts of Caesar to make things easier. Later on, he robbed from the temple currency when they needed an aqueduct there in the area. And he said, he, he, he said, well, this is only fair because the temple is going to benefit from this. And again, there was more revolution and more guerrilla warfare and more people were killed. And uh, Caesar was unhappy 
that he couldn't seem to do things. And so there was written protest after protest after protest at a point where Caesar wondered, what in the world is he doing? And now when all these things have been happening, now here we have a morning where Pilate is visited by another angry Jewish mob. And they're bringing this man, Jesus of Nazareth, before him. And they are going to put him to the test once again. And they shouted that this man's a criminal. And we want you to execute him. And if you don't do it, then you're no fa- uh, friend of Caesar's. They were basically saying, look, your record isn't good with us. And you're not on the good side of Caesar right now. So you do this or else we're going to apply the screws to you and make your life a miserable being. And so he knew he was between a rock and a hard place, and he had a terrible dilemma. And there are a few factors that you need to understand, and I've listed them there in your notes. Number one, it made it very difficult for him because of the claim of Jesus to be a God. Now, my wife argued with me back and forth, Uh, she said, no, he claimed to be God. And I said, no, basically, if you look at the scripture, that that doesn't, it's not the singular in the original language of Jehovah God. It's just a God that the Romans were familiar with. In verse 11, look what it says. Jesus stood before Pilate and he asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Referencing the idea that you're one of the gods that the Jews uh, recognize. And he says, yes, it is as you say. And the gospel of John says that Jesus added, but my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate did not want to incur the wrath of one of the gods if Jesus was who he said he was. And so he was concerned about getting that all out of the way. But the second thing was, Jesus was very impressive when he stood before Pilate. Look at verse 12. When Jesus was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate asked him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Think about this. Pilate had been in the presence of Caesar. He he knew power. He knew authority when he saw it. And now here in the person of Jesus, he saw someone who was even more powerful and more authoritative than Caesar himself. There was just something about Jesus. And Pilate felt like he was the one who was on the offensive instead of Jesus. The third factor listed there is the counsel of his wife. He was reluctant because she said, you don't want anything to do with this man. Look at verse 19. When Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man. For I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. Listen, no matter how powerful a guy is, most of them are smart enough to listen to their wife when they give advice. In my lifetime, I can look at Uh, some of our presidents and see the influence that their wives had. I referenced that a while back when Rosalind Carter passed away. But it was not just her, but Nancy Reagan had a great deal of influence over President Reagan. Mrs. Obama over President Obama all had considerable influence upon their husbands during their presence. And and I take your advice. I really do. Uh, When people uh, make suggestions and say, hey, Have you thought about this or have you thought about that? Just uh, before the service began, uh, somebody suggested something to me. I listen to what you're saying, but I'll tell you who I listen to most uh, quickly and listen as well as I can. And that's when my wife says, hey, I think we need to talk about something. Basically because I'm afraid of her. And rightly so. A while back, there was a cartoon uh, making the rounds. I thought I had saved it, but uh, making the rounds of social media where a preacher is talking with his wife after the service, and he says, maybe my sermons would be more effective if you would say amen once in a while rather than folding your arms and just saying, yeah, right. (laughs) I get a lot of, yeah, right, uh, at home. Our wives' opinions mean something. And such was the case with Pilate and his wife. 
she didn't want him to have anything to do with Jesus because she had been visited in a dream and said, this is an innocent man and you need to steer clear. Now, in your notes, I've listed a thought and I want you to make sure that you get this. Our past mistakes limit our future options. Pilate made so many blunders over the years. And, and because of that, his options were limited. He didn't have any wiggle room, any negotiating room with the, the Jewish people because every time that he tried to take advantage of them, uh, he lost out. Sometimes we talk so much about the goodness of God or the grace of God or the forgiveness of God, we leave the impression that when you sin, it doesn't really matter. God's just going to forgive and, and forget and we're going to move on. And in a sense, that's true. But what we taught our children and what I've always tried to get people to understand is God forgives you of your eternal consequence of your sin, but there's always going to be some earthly consequences. There's still going to be some things that you're going to have to deal with in this life. When you make dumb decisions, there's usually a consequence that goes along with it that you're going to have to work your way through. In our Bible study this week, we were talking a little bit about David and Bathsheba. We can never talk about the good things that David did, a man after God's own heart, a man who did great things for the kingdom of Israel. We can never talk about David unless we always mention Bathsheba. He begged God for forgiveness. God wiped the slate clean. He said, your sins have been forgiven. But she gave birth to a child and that child died. The remainder of David's children rebelled against him. He lost res they had lost respect for their father, not only as a man, but as the king. And he lost the influence within the kingdom of Israel. Past mistakes limit future options. A preacher friend of mine told me many years ago, sin leaves a scar. It may not be visible, but there's a scar there nonetheless. Uh, God does forgive us, but there's still that remaining consequence. And most all of us bear physical scars. Uh, some of us bear physical scars because it started out with something like, hey, watch me do this. And we do something dumb and there are scars to remind us. I, I have one on my arm because of when I was a boy, I was convinced that my bike was just as fast as this brand new bike that another boy had and I didn't want to be second class. And as we were running this race, he got very close to me and ran me into the side of a barn and I ripped my arm open on a rusty nail. And I jumped right back up on my bike and won the race, but then I dropped my bike because my arm was bleeding like crazy and I walked in and I told my mom, I said, I think I need a Band-Aid. And uh, she said, you need more than that. You need your head examined because she was a very compassionate mother. <laughs> Sometimes we make big mistakes. Look at this quote. The gospel is not just an ambulance at the bottom of the cliff to pick you up, uh, to pick up those who are fallen and wounded. It's also a fence at the top to prevent us from falling in the first place. There are some things that we just avoid because we know that's what's good for us. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 12, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. When you do things contrary to God's will and God's guidelines, there are always going to be consequences. And Pilate had made mistakes earlier in his reign and now he was suffering the consequences and that was part of his dilemma. And so he deliberates on what he's going to do. If you were able to take Matthew 27 and Luke 23 and John 18 and lay those three passages of Scripture down beside each other, you would see a series of attempts by Pilate to get off the hook. Things that he thought would help him to push Jesus off on somebody else. Look, they're listed there for you. First, he tried to just dismiss the whole thing. In Luke 23, he tells the, the chief priest in the crowd, I have no basis for a charge against this man. In other words, just let's just dismiss this case because this is an, ind an individual that's innocent. 
But notice in verse 5, it says, They insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. He started in Galilee, and now he has come all the way here. When Pilate learned Jesus was a Galilean, he tried referring him to Herod. Do you remember who Herod was? Herod was the guy who was responsible for the death of John the Baptist. And so Herod is there in town. Luke 23 says, on hearing this, Pilate asked if Jesus was a Galilean. And when he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. We've seen that before play out in our own lives. We try to get something situated, and we'll go to the county office, and they'll say, well, that's, that, that's not a county thing, that's a state thing. And then we'll go to somebody in the state, and they'll say, no, that's not a state thing, that's a federal thing. And we get to run around, it seems like, sometimes when we're just trying to get something simple taken care of, and they keep pushing it from one group to another group to another group. Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, and he wanted him to take care of the situation for him. Now, Herod was well-versed as to who Jesus was. I mentioned he had already put John the Baptist, his cousin, to death. And so now he has Jesus here right before him, and he wants Jesus to do some spectacular miracles. Let's, let's see you perform like I've heard you perform before. And when Jesus refused to do miracles, actually Jesus refused to even speak before Herod, Herod was put out by it. And that's where we read about Jesus being mocked and spit upon in a royal robe put upon him and calling him king. Now think about it. All the time that Jesus is spending with Herod, Pilate thinks that he's free of the situation, free of the problem. And in my mind, I picture that he's probably sitting down to breakfast, enjoying the beginning of a morning free of all the problems that the Jewish leaders had with him. When all of a sudden, Jesus and the soldiers and the Jewish mob are on his doorstep once again saying, take care of this issue. And I would imagine they were more impatient now than they had been before because they were tired of getting the runaround from people like Pilate and Herod. And so he tries something else. He tries to provide him amnesty. Look at our text again, verse 15 uh, of Matthew 27. It was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. It was a, a, a tradition to keep things peaceful and quiet. There would be a time within the celebration of the festival, uh, festivals to, to release somebody. And so at that time, they had a notorious prisoner named Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas or this man, Jesus, who is called the Christ? For they knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. So he has this idea. I'm going to take Jesus, who is a simple individual, loved by many, put him up against Barabbas, who's a notorious criminal that no one would want to have lunch with, and ask them, you choose who I release and who I condemn. That would be like us saying, okay, here, you can choose Jesus, or you can choose Jeffrey Dahmer. You, you can choose Jesus or you can choose Osama bin Laden. It, it, it's your choice. Whoever you would like to have. Put the, put the decision back on them. And in verse 20, look what it says. The chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas. They had to persuade them to make the wrong decision. And then Pilate asked, what shall I do then with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all answered, crucify him. And then he tried to reason. You can't reason with a crowd. But he tried. He asked, what has he done to be worthy of such a 
uh, type of a conviction or punishment. You can't reason with the crowd. They just shouted all the louder to crucify him. So he tried to appease them. And in verse 26, it says that he had Jesus flogged. Now, John's gospel relates that Jesus was whipped in an attempt to satisfy the mob. Do you realize that it was 20 years ago, this time of the year, when the passion of the Christ came out for the first time? Do you remember that movie, The Passion of the Christ? Do you remember how vivid the, the flogging, the beating of Jesus was? Do you remember how difficult it was to sit there and watch that? It was probably the most inhumane depiction, uh, the most vivid depiction of, of that of flogging that any of us had ever seen before in any other movie. I made the mistake a couple years after that movie came out to run a film clip while I was preaching about the crucifixion. And I had, when I was standing up there speaking and that clip was going, and I had no way to tell the person to stop the clip, I had people crying loudly in both services. And when I came out, several ladies told me, don't ever show anything like that ever again. They had lived through it once, watching it on TV or in the theater, and they didn't want to be reminded again of it. And that scourging, where Jesus was stripped of his clothing and he was bound to an upright pole and he was beaten, and many of them were beaten into within an inch of their life. The pain and the shock uh, of the circulatory system was enough for many of them to not even reach crucifixion. It was the most severe type of beating known to man at that time. And just hearing it, I see some of you just shaking your head and shaking your head because you remember just how terrible that was. But why have we become so accustomed to just talking about it without even being moved by it anymore? John's Gospel says, once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. I find no fault in this man, Jesus. And when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and I'm sure that it was just uh, saturated with blood, Pilate said to them, here is your man. And as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw Jesus, they shouted, crucify, crucify him. And so Pilate's efforts and all the things that I just mentioned had failed. And the sight of blood, of Jesus' blood, did not satisfy their thirst. And there was nothing else that would do other than to have him put to death. And so Pilate made a decision. After he had put, been put through all of this, and even though he had enough information to make a good decision, he didn't. I mean, he had the testimony of Jesus, so he knew he was an innocent man. He knew how corrupt his accusers were. He knew that they were just turning him over out of envy. They were tired of Jesus taking a back seat to what Jesus was doing. He had received the counsel from his wife as she said, don't have anything to do with him. You'll never, never get past it. And he compared Jesus to one of the most uh, terrible individuals that they had known at that point in time, a guy by the name of Barabbas. So he had all the right information to make a good decision, but he refused to make the right decision. And I think there are a lot of people who miss out on the blessings of life because they can't make the right decision. There are some people who just can't seem 
to do what is right when they know they need to do it. They delay, they play it safe, they talk it to death, they deliberate, they pray, they agonize, they talk to more people, and they just can't seem to make the decision when they know what the decision is that they need to make. I talk with folks a lot who keep putting off the most important decision of their life when they need to make a decision for Jesus to live for him wholeheartedly not just when it's convenient not just when it's easy but when things are tough I I get people who tell me that they're going to do it someday but right now they just need to put the pieces of their puzzle together so that they know exactly what it is that they're doing And when they're going to decide someday, uh, but just not right now. Or or they'll tell me, well, I've got to straighten some things out in my life. I've got to set my house in order. I've got to take care of some situations that I need uh, to to get past, get over. And and a lot of times I'll just tell folks, if you could do it on your own, then you wouldn't need Jesus. Let Jesus help you get through those situations. Let him help you work through what you need to work through. But they want to see if they can't work it out on their own. And there are people who say, well, you know, right now I'm just not ready. I'm going to have to do this or I'm going to have to take care of that. And this isn't a good time for me to do that. And they do all they can to convince themselves that they've got plenty of time. And we know all too well that that's not always the case. Because Pilate eventually came to the point where he had to ask the crowd, so what do I do about Jesus? There was a time to make a decision. And he was the only one who could do it. But he put it back on the people hoping that they would help him make the right decision. And unfortunately, his was one that was selfish. Look at verse 24. Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere. And sometimes we're always spinning our wheels. And that instead, there was an uproar. So he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I am innocent of this man's blood. Now it is your responsibility. Mark in his gospel says that Pilate just wanted to satisfy the crowd. But the next verse of our text, verse 25 says, all the people answered, let his blood be on us and on our children. We're okay with the decision that you're making. We'll take the guilt and we'll even pass it along for generations. And so he yielded big time to the peer pressure even though he knew the decision that he was making was incorrect. He did what he thought was politically correct to save his own skin. And he had permitted Jesus to be executed through an unjust verdict just because he didn't want to make a tough decision. We see that same response in our government today. I... I wrote this out, and then I crossed it out, then I wrote it out again, then I crossed it out again. So this is the third time that I've thought about whether or not to say this, but I, I watched the State of the Union address, and then I watched the rebuttal, and it, it sickened me. It, it, it's like watching a volleyball match. It's not my fault, it's your fault. No, it's not my fault, it's your fault. I mean, once again, the whole abortion issue comes up again. After over 63 million abortions in our country in, our, in my lifetime. And back and forth, it goes over and over again. That political hot potato just will not go away because no one wants to make the right decision. And it, never mind that it's a moral decision. Never mind that it's something that has to be done. 
Let's just put it off on somebody else instead of talking about it ourselves. We agree to not decide when a decision has to be made. And I believe deep down that's where Pilate was. He knew he had to make it a choice. But he had chosen selfishly. And all the water in the world wasn't going to wipe away his guilt. Matter of fact, you know, I told you he only lasted about 10 years. Tradition says that just a couple years after this, he was relieved of his duty and banished to another country for his incompetence. Pilate was most concerned about saving his job, and he did so temporarily. But he lost his self-respect, and he lost his peace of mind, and he lost everything that he had dreamed of. Jesus put it this way, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? See, it's not just the politicians. We're all guilty at times of trying to wash our hands of Jesus, trying to wash our hands of making the right decisions. We all know that there are situations that we don't want to have to decide on. We'll just kind of wait and hope somebody else will make it for us. I think that it's a rare and special Christian who will take a stand for Christ regardless of the consequences. I'm pretty excited about what's going on right now here within our family. Uh, we have a ladies' Bible study that's going on, and their, their theme is being loved by God, and they're looking at specific Old Testament figures that understood that while everybody else was just kind of looking at them, that they were loved by God and they stood firm no matter the consequences. And our fellows have been looking on Saturday mornings at Ecclesiastes. The very first week we came together, uh, one of them said, you told us we were going to look at Ecclesiastes. I read the first chapter. Everything's meaningless. And that's what it says in Ecclesiastes 1. All of life is meaningless. I said, yeah, but it's like most other books. It gets better as you get toward the end. And here is Solomon, the wisest man of the world, who begins by saying, I've tried everything and nothing works. But when you get toward the end of the book, he said, one thing I have figured out, fear God and keep his commandments. That's what will get you through. And then Wednesday night, we've started on the minor prophets. And a lot of people will tell you that this book's no longer relevant. They'll tell you that it's archaic. It doesn't have good food for thought. But we picked out the minor prophets written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus. And as we worked our way through the first one, Hosea, we've seen how relevant it is to 2024. Hosea was married to a woman who was unfaithful and wanted nothing to do with him. And it's so much the picture of our world and God and the relationship that he desires, but the world just doesn't seem to want to have. Now we're going to have some other classes as well. It comes down to understanding who we are and what we stand for, what we value. Jim Elliott said it the best. He is no fool who exchanges that which he cannot keep for that which he will never lose. All these things that we deem to be so important in our world are going to pass by. The only thing that really matters is who is Jesus to you? Let's pray. Father, to be perfectly honest, sometimes we just really struggle with being the people that we know we need to be. 
we struggle to get through uh, the life that you've blessed us with, the journey that we're on, because we seem to feel like we have so many different people to please. And we make some decisions, and they're not, they're not always the best decisions. So help us to stand for you and your values and to live in such a way that when people see us, they will see there's something different about us. Help us to put Jesus first in all that we say and all that we do so that we don't go about crucifying him all over again. Thank you for loving us the way that you do. And most of all, we do. We thank you for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing. Good to see all of you here today. Let's bow for our closing prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we could be in your house and, and study your word and hear your word preached. Uh, Father, it is our prayer that we will uh, take what we have learned and use it every day of our lives, not just on Sunday morning, but in our lives every day. That we will put our faith in you, that we will trust you, and that we will live the life that you want us to live. Be with us now as we go to our homes. It is in Jesus' blessed name that we pray. Amen. Roaring with power and fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Have a great week.